Hello, welcome everybody. This is um, um, this is a most interesting evening. Um, not only because we have Don Idy here, um, distinguished professor uh, from the Sony Brooks University, and above all, you could say the first, the founder of the the. Uh, philosophy of technology in North America, the, the godfather, we called him, in one of our texts. So we're very happy to have you here. Um, also, because you're not the youngest, but this is a very young place. This is, this is, this is the youngest place at the university ever. Uh, this is the first time we're here as Radboud Reflex, and it's also the first uh, yeah, event here. There was, a, there was a, a screening of a movie yesterday, but... Uh, apart from that, so this this is the birth of this uh, C, it's called. So welcome at C. C with C is the slogan, I'm told. So uh, we'll meet we'll meet here a lot of times, I think, in the future. But this is the first time. So um, um, welcome all. For uh, uh, nice to have you here. And Don Adi is here. Uh, we're very happy to have him here tonight because he's done uh, a seminar all day today an expert seminar. He's going to do it all day tomorrow. Uh, so we're very happy that you have made the time to come also for this public event. Um, so the seminar was organized by Peter Lemons and Joni van der Ede. They're still trying to get here, I think, from the restaurant. It's, uh, <laughs> but we, uh, so if there's some disturbance later on, people coming in, um, uh, welcome them, give them a warm welcome. They, they, they should be here. And, uh, uh, so I'll thank them now, Peter Lemons and Joni van der Ede, the organizers, and I will do so at the end again, because then they can actually uh, hear it. Um, yes, so Don Idy, philosopher of technology, post-phenomenologist uh, also. He's uh, written a lot of books, uh, 22 so far, and uh, he's working on the, the 23rd. Uh, he's, call, he's calling them a little late life books. Uh, and the next one is going to be about um, aging and uh, in aging becoming a cyborg, really. Um, uh, um, hearing implants, uh, new lenses, new knees. So, um, yeah, so, so most of us, of a lot of us, will be cyborgs in a way, um, but maybe not as much uh, as I do. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll get into that later on. Um, we're also very honored to have Peter Paul Verbeek here, um, professor of philosophy of technology of the Universiteit Twente, um, founder of the co-founder of the Design Lab of the University of Twente, um, and he's um, he's a he's a student and apprentice uh, of Dan ID. So we. We've invited him today to give an introductory le uh, lecture and, um, well, reel you in and tell you all about uh, Don Idy's work. And then afterwards, they'll discuss it. How has Peter Paul Verbeek inherited Don Idy's uh, work? Um, what is philosophy of technology uh, today? What's the, what are the most urgent, pressing uh, questions? Should we? Should we want to become cyborgs? Is there a limit to that? Uh, we'll get into that later on uh, in the discussion. And of course, at the end, uh, we'll give the floor to, to you as well for questions. And um, But that's at the end, after we've talked about death as well, mortality and death, <laughs> because uh, that's, that's always good to, to, to end uh, with. I think um, that's all for now. I'll ask Peter Paul Verbeek on stage. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Wonderful, so many people here. Um, it's, it's an honor, actually, to give this uh, talk about uh, Don. Indeed, you could see me as uh, a student of uh, Don's. I think uh, if, if Don wouldn't have been there, I might not have ended up in the philosophy of technology, <laughs> actually. Uh, so it, it also feels a bit weird. I think our work has developed also a lot in interaction with each other. So it was for me also a really nice exercise to think, okay, how, how am I going to give a 15, 20 minute introduction to the work of uh, the thinker who has inspired me so much, but of, uh, also with whom I've grown together so much. So maybe um, let's just uh, give it a try uh, by explaining to you how uh, I 
traveled in phenomenology with Don ID from the origins. Uh, if you look at the pictures, you see that they look a lot like each other. <laughs> ID and Husserl, <laughs> they're really different. But of course, phenomenology is uh, well a, a substream, a subfield of philosophy that has always been very inspiring to me, and it has always played also a key role in the philosophy of technology. And you could see Don ID maybe as the thinker who has kept the whole tradition somehow alive, but also gave it a new twist. A new twist on American soil, you could say, wedding phenomenology with American pragmatism, giving a totally new direction to phenomenology. A new way to understand technology with it, but also, I think, a new future for phenomenology itself. So that's why I thought this would be a nice opening picture. Um, I got to know Don myself uh, when I was a first year PhD student and uh, Don was invited at Wageningen University to give a uh, lecture on his work, I think on technology and the life world, which was a book that everybody read by then. I will tell a bit more about that later. And uh, it was extremely helpful for me. And maybe that's the best way to start my introduction to, to Don Heidi. I mean, as a PhD student who wanted to do a PhD in philosophy of technology in a more, yeah, you could say, continental philosophical environment, everybody was really reading Heidegger, everybody had this very negative, romantic, even reactionary approach sometimes to technology, and I didn't feel comfortable with it. I was impressed by the types of thinking, but being an engineer myself as well, uh, I thought it's too remote from practices, it's too remote from actual technological developments. Why only complain about technology, capital T, it alienates humans from themselves, whereas at the same time you see society changing so much, uh, new interactions between people popping up, new ways of reading and understanding the world. Isn't there a richer way to understand what technologies do in our society than only complaining about technology, alienating us from the world? That was some kind of a basic intuition with which I was wrestling, then I heard Don's talk in Wageningen, and then I knew this is going to be the way to approach it, because it was a totally new approach. It was an approach uh, in which the whole materiality of technology, the things of technology, played a very explicit role. And that actually was the beginning of a lot of interaction. Maybe it's also nice to show you a bit of what it looked like. So this is a, a picture of uh, Don Eide's farewell roast, as you could call it, at Stony Brook University. Don had a tradition in his technoscience seminar that he was running there to have a roast every year with some kind of a well-known philosopher of technology. So his last deed at Stony Brook University was to be the, uh, the, 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 the person who was being roasted there, the official how did you call that? Uh, some kind of a roast tea, I think that was the, <laughs> the name that you had for it. And um, well, of course, done in, in his office at the Technoscience Group. This was the place where it all happened and where I had a lot of inspiration. So let me tell you a bit about his work in three lines. I want to say something about this word, a tongue twister maybe for many people, post phenomenology, it's not an easy pronounceable word, but this is I think the main contribution of Don ID to the phenomenological discussion and also a new approach to new technologies, a new way of understanding technology. And further on, I will have two more topics to explain a bit uh, what Don's work is all about. I think one of the very first books Don wrote was this book. It was not the very first, but one of the very first. Experimental phenomenology. And I think that already says it all. Phenomenology in philosophy is actually a way to approach the world in terms of what appears to you, in terms of the concreteness, the details, the, the everyday reality. It tried to be some kind of a counterpart to all too abstract ideas about the world. Uh, the, the key idea in phenomenology is that we should understand the world in terms of the relations that we have with it. Intentionality, they call it. It's a very basic intuition. We cannot just hear, we always hear something. We cannot just see, we see something. Uh, we always somehow direct it at the world around us and phenomenology tries to take that as a starting point. The everyday experience as the basis of a lot of other things. And what Donaidi did was not just writing an introduction to how the history of the field looks like, it was something that you can do. You can do experiments with phenomenology. Like he would let you walk like a bat using echolocation and with your eyes closed and then you do this and you can walk through a room. And that's to experience what phenomenology is. It's experimenting with how the world can appear to you. I think it all developed into uh, a big dialogue at the beginning with uh, a very famous thinker about technology, a very famous phenomenologist, Martin Heidegger. You could see, I think, a lot of Don's work as a discussion with Heidegger, and a very critical one at that, you could say. 
Heidegger uh, uh, is still a very influential thinker, and I must say he also influences me a lot, uh, even more than I sometimes want. <laughs> uh, Heidegger, um, especially for a few decades, has been the most central thinker in continental philosophy about technology. And Heidegger explains technology as actually a way of understanding the world, as what he even calls an interpretation of, of being, of what it means to be. In Heidegger's thinking, the word being, to be, has a history. In various eras uh, over the past centuries, the word to be has changed its meaning, according to Martin Heidegger. That's kind of a weird idea if you hear it for the first time. I mean, everybody thinks that you know what you mean if you use the word to be. Heidegger says, well, actually this has changed meaning a lot, and technology is the current manifestation of what it means to be. In the old times, to be meant to come into being, to be revealed somehow. If you analyze the old Greek words, if the Greeks used the word being, it always meant something like coming into being, coming from what is hidden somewhere into what's here in everyday lives. Then it changed to being, meaning having been created by God. It comes from somewhere, but now you know where it comes from. It has a source, it has an, an origin, an entity. Not being as a verb, but being uh, as, a, as, a, as a noun. Uh, the highest being, God, is the source of the being of things. Then the modern sciences came. And then being suddenly meant being an object opposed to a subject. The human observer in a world out there. And that laid the basis, according to Heidegger, for the current interpretation of being, being as technology as being um, a source of raw materials that is there for human manipulation. Technology is the basic framework with which we interpret the world and even ourselves. We have become a stock of materials that we can somehow manipulate with, that we can intervene in. The world is what it is for us in terms of what we can, can make out of it. And for Heidegger, that is actually a danger. And not just a danger, it's the highest danger, Heidegger says, because there's no way out. Every attempt to develop an alternative interpretation of the world actually somehow throws you back into technology itself. Because then you're actually trying to design a new understanding of the world. Then you try to exert power over the fact that you are exerting power. Every attempt to get out... Uh, well, lets you fall back in. There is no escape, except uh, mystical things like the will not to will. And that's where he ends up, letting things be, and that will be the only way to experience a different meaning of being. Well, I will not go into more details, but the key of the analysis is technology is alienating us from that more original understanding of what it means to be. Everything becomes raw material, ready for human manipulation. And then the world, nature, become objects that we can use for ourselves, for our own purposes. The intrinsic value of things gets lost more and more, and we narrow our interpretation of ourselves and of the world. I think Don's basic intuition was that this was both overly romantic and nostalgic on the one hand, and also way too abstract. For Heidegger, actually, every technology we encounter is yet another expression of that will to power. He even said at some point that he could not even make a distinction between the Holocaust and agricultural techniques because they were all just embodiments of that will to power that we exert over reality. Well, if you cannot make such a distinction, then, well, you might say that you have an issue with your framework with, this, with which you try to understand the world. And it's also nostalgic. Heidegger has some kind of a preference for older techniques. He makes analyses of, for instance, a wooden uh, kind of, well, no, let's say a windmill. Um, and that's an old technique. And he contrasts that with the power plant placed into the Rhine. He says the power plant forces the Rhine to show itself as a supplier of energy. Whereas the windmill has to wait for the wind to blow. It cannot always work. You cannot store the energy. You, you're part of nature. It's, it's, it embodies a different approach. Well, then... Don comes in and says, well, actually, this is uh, way too abstract and way too nostalgic. What about actual technologies? Not technology as a way of thinking, but just the actual material stuff in the world around us. How do the technologies in our world help us to make sense of the world itself? 
And how could you actually keep up the nostalgic preference for old windmills if we live in an era where we have a lot of windmills too that are also somehow feeding themselves into nature, but maybe in a different way. Maybe they also reveal something uh, of, of nature, but maybe in this time in a different way. Why would it be alienating and not uh, somehow show nature in a new way? So what Donaidi did was actually move towards another phenomenologist, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, a French thinker who uh, read phenomenology a bit less in a hermeneutic way, a bit less uh, f focusing on how we understand and interpret the world, what hermeneutics is, but he focused on human perception. And uh, this type of thinking, as I said, it's always about the human relation with the world. And for Heidegger, that being in the world took shape in terms of understanding being as the basis for our being in the world. For Merleau-Ponty, it's typically about perception, how we experience the world. And that actually made it much more concrete, because then you can also try to study how technologies play a role in our perceptions, how they change our perception, how we can also see new things with technology that we could not see, how new technologies like infrared photographs do not alienate us from a wood, for instance, but offer actually a new way uh, uh, to experience that wood. You can now see whether a tree is ill or not on a, on a picture, and you could not do that before. It's, it's, it's not always alienating, it shapes a new relation, and we should understand the structure of the relations. So that's why Don then ended up in calling his approach post-phenomenology. Post-phenomenology to team up a bit with the postmodern wave that was still in, in his last days, I think, back then. Uh, but also because he wanted to distinguish himself a bit from the overly romantic aspects of the more classical uh, views in um, the field of phenomenology. Post-phenomenology is keeping up the ambition, I would say, to think about human-world relations and the structure of the relations between humans and the world around us, but not to somehow make sure that there is uh, some kind of an emphasis on the very originality of natural perception, and we should be careful that, and not to let science and technology uh, interfere too much. It's more like this is the basic structure, and what role can technology play in that human-world relation? So that's actually when technology comes in. I should speed up a bit so I suppress the, <laughs> the thoughts that I also have to explain to you. So, post phenomenology is not just a new approach to phenomenology, it's actually also a way to help us understand technology. The things, the material objects in the world around us. And that's not a very self-evident thing to do in philosophy, of course, to think about things. It's typically about ideas, words, not about material objects. I think here, Actually, both Heidegger and Don Eide are main thinkers in phenomenology that try to do exactly that. So one of his first books on technology was this book. And in this book, Don Eide tried to analyze the structure of the interactions that humans can have with technologies. I will say a bit more about that, but it's typically about how do technologies play a role in our sensory relation with the world? How we can embody a technology, look through your pair of glasses and not at them, for instance, somehow technologies can become part of the human world relation and shape it somehow. And that, that opens a totally new view. It's not alienating, it's actually en en enabling new relations. I think his uh, well biggest book uh, was then this book, Technology in the Life World, where he expands that into a theory of technology in our everyday life world. How can we understand how technology shapes what it means to be human and what it means to live in a technological culture? Maybe if you want to explain that at the most basic way, I'd like to do it like this. It is an alternative way to do the thing that the phenomenologists have always wanted to do, and that is to move beyond the subject-object distinction. That's actually the main ambition of phenomenology, that you should not divide the world in two camps, eh, the human subjects and the non-human objects, but that you, you should try to focus on the relations between them. You cannot just have humans, but they are always linked to the world. As, as I said, we always see something, we hear something. And the world in itself will probably exist. It doesn't make much sense to ask yourself any question about the world in itself, because as soon as you ask a question about the world in itself, it stops being the world in itself. It's, and, and it becomes the world for you, as you interpret it, as you have a relation with it. So phenomenology tries to overcome this 
split. And for technology, that's actually interesting because it helps us to understand how technologies play this constitutive role in human existence. How it helps us to blur somehow the boundary between humans and technologies, not in an alienating sense, but in a way in which it helps us to, to become humans in specific ways. It means that actually it's totally opposed to an instrumentalist idea of technology. And the technology is just a tool that you can pick up and use. And then you keep up the separation between humans and technologies. Then humans have the goals and they use technologies as instruments, but they're not at stake somehow. That's not what happens. It also means that you don't want to go into the other direction where technology is in charge and captivates us humans, uh, suppress, uh, overpowers us. And the whole idea is that technology somehow organizes our life, helps to organize how we live our lives. I'm not sure this is an attractive picture, but it, it, it's a good example, <laughs> I think, of where you end up then. We are still humans, and we are still free to choose what to do. But the cell phone has changed a lot, especially a lot in public sphere, in human interaction, concentration, attention. And many people have said that, and people learn to deal with it. But this is maybe a very good example of how technologies start to play a role in human-world relations. Well, what post phenomenology then does is actually quite basic. That human-world relation that plays such a big role in phenomenology becomes a human-technology-world relation. Technology should not be placed in the realm of objects, the realm of the world, as opposed to the human subject. Technology is the relation. That's, I think, the most important insight from post phenomenology Technology is the relation between humans and the world. It is how we are connected. It's our medium. It's our milieu. The, uh, the water in which we swim, the way in which we are linked to the world around us. That's how we should see technologies. It's also a particular thing. How can technology be between humans and the world where it's also about objects that are part of the world? And I think in this sense, ID also builds upon Heidegger. Heidegger, uh, actually maybe one small ID in the early work of Heidegger, where he tried to understand tools and how tools play a role in the human world relation. And Heidegger there makes a very famous distinction between two ways in which a tool can be there for human beings. Uh, Zuhanden and Vorhanden in German. So to hand or at hand, as he calls it. If you use a hammer, your attention is typically not with a hammer, but with the nail that you want to get into the wall. If you focus on a hammer, you, you hit your thumb. So it's, it's, it's a two hand, it's, it's, a, it's an extension of your body almost. Only when it stops functioning, then suddenly it asks attention for itself and then it's at hand. Or the other way around, if you need to learn how to drive a car, at the beginning it's at hand. You need an instructor to look on the road uh, in order not to have an accident because you are operating the car. You need to switch gears and to steer and to brake. Your attention is with the car. After a while you well, expand yourself and you feel how wide the car is. You don't need to look if you will not hit somebody. You, you feel it. You feel the bumps in the road through the car. And then at some point you don't need your instructor anymore. You, you can also pay attention to the road because you don't need to think anymore when you operate the car. At that moment, the car becomes two hand. It becomes part of your relation with the world. And you, you change. People behave differently in a car than when they are on a bike or uh, when they walk. You would not bike on uh, uh, two meters behind somebody with your fist in the air because you want to uh, uh, well, uh, be on the place where that person is driving. In my car, I, I have that very often when I look in my mirror. <laughs> People tend to get more aggressive because they're in a hurry. And, and so the, the car also changes the orientation on the world, the way in which you interact with other people. Well, that's what we have come to call mediation. Technology as a medium mediates human world relations. And then Don Aidi has been uh, really influential for offering us a language to analyze the structure of uh, the various ways in which technologies can organize human-world relations. Sometimes you embody a technology, like a pair of glasses that you look through and not at. And so the arrows uh, and the brackets here indicate that the arrow is the intentionality, the way in which humans are directed at the world. And uh, you see also which entities are linked to each other through the brackets. And so here humans and technologies team up, as it were, and that unity is directed at the world. When you read a thermometer, Actually, you don't feel whether it's hot or cold outside, but you, you see a number. You need to interpret it in order to know if a patient has a fever or something. So then actually a technology teams up with the world. 
gives you a representation of the world and you read the world through the technology. A hermeneutic relation. In hermeneutics, it's about interpretations. Or you interact with the technology. And when you try to get money from an ATM, you, you interact with the technology, the world behind it is not very relevant. Or technologies form the context for your experience. A background, eh, the, the sound of the fridge, eh, the switches on and off. It's, it's a context, you don't experience it directly, but it does play a role in how you experience the world. So this is what Don Heide has given us. And then this has become the basis for analyzing how technologies play a role in various domains uh, of our world and how we have social interactions, but also, for instance, how we do science. You cannot do science without instruments. And how do those scientific instruments then organize the relations between scientists and the world they are observing, they try to see? If you look at the moon through a telescope, then suddenly you change. You become an observer and the moon something to be observed. And you see things you cannot see with your bare eye. It influences your framework of interpretation. I will get to that later. But that's how you can use those schemes to analyze how technologies link us to the world. I should speed up a bit, right? I still have like f five minutes, it's okay? Yeah. Another central concept in post phenomenology that I want to give to you is um, the concept of multi-stability. And Don always illustrates this with the help of this cube, the Necker cube. Maybe people in social science will uh, know uh, the cube. Uh, the whole idea of multi-stability is that we should not think about technology in an essentialistic way. It doesn't have any essence. What the technology is, is the outcome of the relations that we have with it. Not only, of course, it, it, it is something, but that becomes meaningful in the context of the relations that we have with the technologies. Uh, like the example of a typewriter that was invented actually as a tool for people with bad eyesight, who then could still write. And then it ended up being a piece of office equipment that developed into a computer. Multi-stability is also something in this picture. The Necker cube actually has as its main idea that this is not one thing. It depends on how you look at it, what you see. There is a specific, so you can see this plane popping out of the screen, or you can see this plane popping out of the screen. Or you can see 2D as, a, as an insect in a, in a web. It's three things at the same time. It depends on how you see it, what it is. And that's multi-stability. And in the same way, technologies are multi-stable. Mediations are not in the technologies. Mediations are the outcomes of the relations that we have with the technologies. So what ID then was doing is to analyze how technologies influence our perception. As I said, building on Meloponti, and then he makes a distinction between micro-perception, sensory perception, where there's an amplification and a reduction. Some things you see or hear or feel better and otherwise and other things move to the background. But there's also macro-perception. It's not only sensory perception, and the sense data, as it were. It's also how, how we make sense of the world, how we see the world in terms of how, how do we understand it. When at some point Galileo started to study the moon with a telescope, he came from a framework of understanding the heavenly bodies as perfectly round balls. And through the telescope he suddenly saw all kinds of dots and spots and at first he thought it was aberrations in the lens and he made the lenses better and better, but the better the lenses were, the, the better he saw the spots. And at, so, at some point, he could not escape the thought that the moon might not be a perfectly round ball. There might just be craters and mountains on the moon. And that actually was well, the cause of a total revolution in seeing what that moon actually is. And the micro-perception actually induced a new macro-perception mediated by the telescope. Well, that's maybe the third concept that I want to give to you quickly. And that's the whole idea of material Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, interpretation, is not something that only happens in our minds. It's something that we do, something practical, something that, that, that's linked to materiality, to objects, to things. Yeah, and, well, but this example of Galileo, which I gave to you already, his new way of understanding the moon and the whole new cosmology that came out of that actually is not thinkable without the telescope. <laughs> The telescope was not just a neutral instrument that helped him to see the moon better. It changed the way in which he understood the moon. It also changed the way in which a scientist sees her or himself as an observer of something to be observed, a phenomenon out there. And, with, and we have knowledge inside of ourselves. 
So this has been a main theme that Don has been uh, uh, working on in the philosophy of science, in his book Instrumental Realism, where he tries to link instruments to what is real. The world becomes real for us through instruments, and we need to understand how scientific instruments help us to read the world. You cannot understand the content of science without taking seriously that the content is partly the result of interactions with technologies. It also became a broader hermeneutic approach in his book Expanding Hermeneutics. It's a collection of essays about, about how technologies, material culture plays a role and how we understand the world and especially how vision plays a role in, uh, in science. And then of course that is a big thing to do. Um, the last thing that I will say. And if you try to understand the role of instruments in science, you can just say, okay, scientific instruments help you to, under, to, to see the world, and uh, well, there's not too much fuss about that. Uh, better instruments let you see nature better, and uh, it just makes science better. That would be kind of a positivistic reading. Yeah? You just have uh, objective knowledge about the world, and instruments help you to make that objectivity better. But actually, a lot of the instruments that we have now, and maybe this is uh, a, a good example, cannot easily be read like that. A radio telescope sees for the radiation that our eyes cannot see. So there is no other way, actually, for astronomy than to use an instrument and to use the way in which an instrument sees the skies and to make some kind of a translation to what we can see. So there is already a hermeneutics in the instrument, some kind of a translation, an interpretation of what is there to be seen, because we cannot see it, <laughs> towards something that we can see. And then after that, scientists make sense of <coughs> what they see on the picture. Which means that actually in the content <coughs> of how we understand the world, the role of instruments should be taken seriously into account. You can even expand that, for instance, in the, in the medical field, sometimes you have competing ways of seeing things in the body. At the University of Twente, where I work, people are working on a, a, an opto-acoustic technique, uh, so it combines light and sound to see cancer tumors, actually breast cancer. So it's a non-invasive method and also another painful method to see tumor. And, um, it gives different type of pictures than X-ray does, and also different type of pictures than MRI does. So, a surgeon can look at uh, such a picture, an X-ray, an MRI. You can uh, take biopsy. You can feel that they should have five ways to get in touch with the tumor, as it were. Five different ways. And of course, then the question is, how can they converge? Is, is, is one of them the best one? Or should you deduce the only possible diagnosis from combining the five? Are they all five somehow variations on, on the same thing? Or do they all somehow produce a different tumor? There are many ways in which you can try to, to, to make sense of how technologies mediate here. And that's actually what makes it so fascinating. Because then you also bring the human back. You cannot only rest on the idea that technology mediates. Mediation only makes sense in the context of humans that make sense of the mediations. Mediations do not just come to us, but we appropriate mediations. We make sense of them. We try to read the world through technologies. So that's the whole tour from Husserl to ID. Phenomenology, understanding the relation between humans and the world. Don ID taught us that you can only understand it well if you take technology into account and on the fly develop a new way of seeing how technology changes what it means to be human. Thank you. Thank you, and um, I would like to invite you on stage. Yeah, uh, yeah. Please sit okay, in the middle. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So they can buy the coffee. Yeah. yeah. Well. Thank you, Peter Paul, for that enlightening introduction. Um, I'm wondering, um, Don, philosophy is, of course, always about inheritance also. about um, You came here uh, by flight, of course, and then the train. 
I went with you from the airport to, uh, to here and uh, we discussed a lot of things. Among others, um, mortality, death, we'll get to it in the end, as, <laughs> as I said. And you mentioned that um, you met all of the big philosophers. Uh, you met Rorty, Dreyfus, Derrida. Um, and I started thinking about that Derrida uh, has thought a lot about inheritance, how you live on in other philosophers that follow you. Um, do you feel that you're in a way survey living on in Peter Paul? <laughs> Beautiful for me, for me. Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm very, very proud of Peter Paul. Yeah. He is clearly the <laughs> foremost European post-phenomenologist. <laughs> uh, he's done a wonderful job. Uh, he's been a Socrates professor. He's been running graduate programs uh, in Twente and other associated universities. And I have to tell one story about him, <laughs> which he has a different version of. Uh, I, as, as he said, I met him when he was a graduate student. He was, how old and, were you then? Uh, 19? No, 19? So, no, 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 not, not 19. I think 22, 23, maybe. 20, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I, I come to Holland every, like, at least once a year, sometimes twice, sometimes thrice. And um, so I've known him for a long time. And he goes through different phases. And one of his earlier phases was he was also interested in Bruno Latour. <laughs> and Bruno Latour is probably still the foremost science technology analyst in Europe. He has a theory which he calls actor network theory. And we both know uh, Bruno Latour. So... Peter Paul has always been interested in, because actually Bruno Latour's theory and my theory are relatively close. We have a lot of overlapping, et cetera. In fact, we have analyzed a lot of the same examples. Uh, I analyzed the example of uh, picking fruit off a tree with a stick using a human example. Bruno Latour has the same one using a monkey example. And uh, we've both analyzed uh, the uh, NRA's uh, notion that uh, guns kill humans, not humans, or humans kill humans, not guns kill humans. And we both have an analysis of that. So we've had a lot of overlapping. And so in 1998 was one of my sabbatical years, and I did a long lecture tour all through about six uh, Dutch universities, and Peter Paul had organized a sort of consortium of universities to which I was to give a, a seminar, and I had organized the seminar around a theme that we had agreed upon, which and was? we got here, I don't remember what the theme was, mm -hmm. but when we got here, Peter <laughs> Paul says, no, you're not going to do that, we want to know <laughs> how you relate to actor network theory. Uh. Well, it turns out that I had used Bruno Latour's Science in Action just the previous semester uh, in my Philosophy of Science course, and so I agreed to do this, but I had to change my entire <laughs> seminar, which was for three hours to <laughs> deal with Bruno Latour and post-phenomenology, which for, was already for Peter Paul, you did. that part. <laughs> So that's, that's my story about Peter Paul. Now, uh, <laughs> but heritage. what does it mean? <laughs> uh, actually, we ha I could give lots of stories about Peter Paul and about uh, all of the other philosophers. He's right that uh, he started out with Husserl and then moved to Heidegger, and both of which were highly influential on my own thinking over many, many years. And uh, so in late life, I decided that uh, this needed a relook. So uh, in 2010, I did a book called Heidegger's Technologies, a Post Phenomenological Perspective, and it was a critique of Heidegger on technology. I have always been a crit critic of technology and Heidegger, but this was a heavy duty one, and uh, it related to post phenomenologies. Was, a, was it a form of patricide, maybe? Of <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the ones who teach you that at some point you might have to 
I don't know, cut the ties? Uh, it was a critique, but it was also showing a lot of things from which I don't disagree. Uh, I, so I was paying a debt, a critical debt, so to speak, to uh, Heidegger. Now, in America, we have uh, two long-term organizations. One is called the Heidegger Conference, and the other is the, the Husserl uh, uh, Conference. And I belong to both. And so I give periodic papers, and I, these were the basis for the various chapters in this book, so it, it really goes back quite a long time, uh, but is refined into a very thematic uh, critique of, uh, of Heidegger. I did the same thing with Husserl, and it came out in uh, 2016. This is 2010. Both are uh, Fordham University uh, products. And... Uh, the Heidegger's book, I mean, as Peter Paul knows, and as this conference is, I, I claim that this workshop that's going on is sort of the pushback of the Heideggerians. Uh, <laughs> the, the notion that uh, I criticize Heidegger, et cetera, and claim the priority of post-phenomenology over Heidegger's analysis uh, has stimulated a pushback from the true believers. And uh, so we have a kind of argument in this uh, uh, workshop which is going on between the transcendentalists who are Heideggerians and uh, the post-phenomenologists who are sort of quasi-pragmatists as well. Uh, and uh, so I did Husserl's Missing Technologies, uh, which came out in 2016. Uh, I would like to do a book on Merleau-Ponty because, in fact, I think I'm much closer to Merleau-Ponty than either Huddersfield or Heidegger, but I can't do it until I get more critical distance. So, so now you're this, too close. Uh, the, this, this leads to heritage in another sense. Uh, I'm a very old guy, and it turns out when I fly home on Sunday, that is my 84th birthday. Yeah. So I've hit the older... <laughs> Uh, level of age that full of actually philosophers, many of them live into the 90s and a few into the hundreds. And I'm sort of aiming for that, hoping that I can get another four or five books out before uh, <laughs> passing on. And, and uh, so I go home flying on my birthday, and then two days later, we're going to celebrate my birthday with a very, very fancy restaurant spin off from Denmark's Nobu. <laughs> <laughs> restaurant, and uh, that will make up for the the delay. But um, so I hope that I can make another ten years worth of books, and I have, my next one will be medical techniques, and uh, it will be accepted by Automatic Press, and probably out by the end of April. And so that's the book on, that's on aging the book and on, uh, uh, aging. Yeah. And. Uh, I would like to get into that later, but but first uh, I want to get back at you also, uh, Peter Paul. Um, I mentioned uh, patricide at one point. <laughs> I was. I, yeah, I, 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 I have to. I have to ask. Um, have you or or is there is there something well, going he on? Well, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you in a way? Have you at some point? Um, so now you've taken enough. Up of, of his teachings, and uh, and now you're off on your own. <laughs> like well, uh, well, yeah, I I definitely feel that I'm taking off, but I I, I, I can sincerely say that I I don't really feel the urge to uh, to kill this godfather. <laughs> 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 but maybe the, the best way to answer is also to say that in, in a sense, also in a, in a social way, Don is like a father for many people. Maybe not like a father who, who tells you what to do. It's not a kind of a paternalistic father. But I think one of the nicest things that we have in our uh, group of post is that there it's, it's kind of a nice social group. It's all nice people that somehow gather around Don. And I think it has to do something with uh, the fact that it's, it's not about egos and success and look what I've done. It's like we have this common goal. We want to develop this approach and everybody does their own thing. And that, 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 well, that makes it feel like some kind of a home base and you meet each other on conferences. So in, in that sense, Don yeah, is I, indeed not just an intellectual I form. agree <laughs> with Peter because one of the interesting things about the post 
International Nominological Group, and we, we started in 2007 uh, going to the various STS conferences and uh, creating post-phenomenological research panels. And we have now over 100 researchers out there doing individual technology analysis, et cetera. And it's a really unique group because they, they like each other, they're critical of each other, but they're always also supportive. Mm. Now, over the years, I've been the advisor of about 100 PhDs uh, out of about a dozen countries. And, uh, of course, a fair number from Stony Brook, uh, uh, of which I'm actually very, very proud because uh, when I retired, I created the Don I.D. Distinguished Alumni Award. And so each year we go and we agreed that we would start with all the super profs. These are people who are distinguished professors, research professors, or are named endowed chairs. Well, it turns out that we have six of those amongst our alumni, four of whom are my students. <laughs> yeah. so, so I, this is why I'm very proud of Peter Paul, because he's done so well yeah. <laughs> here and has attained so many. Uh, and he's clearly the most cited European post-phenomenologist. Uh, But there are yeah. ways, of course, in, in, in which I sometimes take a bit of a distance yeah. or in which I am different. So that, that, that's the kind of so, little dispute. So, so I think it's... So um, I, 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 I would like an example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe it's not uh, a coincidence that you mentioned the uh, example of Latour when you gave a talk in, in, in Twente. So I think I've always tried to explore the relations between actor network theory and post phenomenology a bit, maybe sometimes also a bit more than you initially he liked, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I think that also gave us kind of an interesting interaction. And I, I think it, for instance, also led to the idea that that human technology world relation should not be seen as uh, some kind of relation between a human and a world. And then you squeeze the technology between them like a filter between the two or something. Uh, in actor network theory, you would more say that the entities are the outcome of the relations. And I think we've come to see it like that too. So if you look through a telescope, it's not just uh, the pre-given moon and the pre-given scientist with a, uh, an instrument in between, but what the moon is has changed and what it means to do science has changed. And the entities yeah. have changed. So I think that's where I try to find a bit of a distance, but where we also found each other again and develop the approach further. Yeah. One, one, of the, one of my most recent books is a 2015 book called Acoustic Technics. I did a book in, first of all, in 1976 called Listening and Voice, A Phenomenology of Sound, uh, which was the first sort of phenomenological systematic analysis of human auditory experience. And it became very, very well known. It's one of my most cited books. And... Uh, because no, most people don't, most philosophers as well as most scientists are visualists. And so I yeah. was paying attention to the auditory perceptual aspect. And it's led in lots of possible ways. So acoustic techniques is a follow-up of that, looking at high-tech acoustic instrumentation, such as has emerged basically in the 20th century. The all astronomy up until the 20th century was limited to visual astronomy and also limited to the range of white light which we humans are able uh, to see. In 1800, infrared and in 1801, ultraviolet was discovered for the first time. And uh, these we can't see with our naked eyes, although many, many uh, animals and insects can see this. So uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, there begins to be the recognition that our perceptual capacities are actually quite limited. And this should pose a serious problem to phenomenologists, and I would say primarily classical phenomenologists, because they don't deal with instrumental mediation. Uh, what happened during the 19th century was the ultimate discovery that all sorts of forms of radiation uh, come beginning with very long rayed stuff like radio waves, which can be a kilometer or more 
in length down to gamma rays, which are nanometer type uh, ranges. And so much of this we don't get. Uh, the book, The New Astronomy, points out that what we get is like playing the piano with middle C and two notes on each side. The rest of the keyboard we don't get. Yeah. Uh, now, the first breakthrough was radio, radio and radio astronomy and radar because this was the first ability to mediate long-range uh, radiation from the universe. And this led to all sorts of discoveries. For example, lots of stuff in the universe is not light-giving, and so you discover dark areas of, of the universe through radio waves, etc. And ultimately, the background radiation of the universe, which occurs all over the place, which led to a Nobel Prize in 1978. That's how late uh, it was. Mm. And so now, of course, we can image all of this stuff. And with, uh, let's say, X-ray radiation, you can detect pulsars. And a lot of galaxies, pulsars are the next step to black holes. Black holes are one step above pulsars, and they suck everything in. And so you can't get any light at all from, from black holes, whereas pulsars are spinning uh, uh, universe, galaxies which are so fast, they spin multiple times per second. And you can see this, and they shoot out what are called... Uh, radiation waves from there, uh, and you can get all this only on x-rays. You can't get yeah. it with vision. You can't get it with infrared or anything like that. So it's so astronomers like what they call slices of the uh, electromagnetic thing, whereas medical doctors, which you gave an example of, uh, like to have a composite. So if you're doing a brain tumor, you want an MRI, a PET scan, a CT uh, uh, thing, and so forth. And then you put it together with computers. And one of the stories is, uh, what if you then go into the brain surgically and you can't find a tumor? Do you operate anyway? because all your instrumentation has told you that the tumor is there and it looks like this. Yeah. And the answer in these days is yes, you operate anyway, even though you can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so this, I'm claiming that only post-phenomenology is capable of dealing with this kind of mediation in science. Yeah. And therefore we are in a different mode. The same occurs with respect to animals because animals have perceptual capacities we don't have. Snakes, for example, can thermally see mice in the dark. And uh, it turns out that cattle are one of the animals that have magnetic perceptions. And this was discovered in the funniest way. People were looking at Google Maps and they discovered that, uh, that cattle line up on magnetic lines when they're, uh, when they're eating. And uh, unless they are in close to high uh, tension electric lines, which <laughs> confuse the magnetic things, and then the cattle are at random. Uh, but do, I, we, do I, we know why they do that? Uh, well, because they are detect the magnetic rays, and I guess they like to line up. And and that, feels, that feels nice. Or, or, it, or. it feels nice. <clears throat> And what's really <laughs> funny is I come to Europe a lot and I take a lot of train rides. So I've taken to the habit of observing cattle to see yeah. And lo and behold, <laughs> they line up this time, this way when they're eating, etc. Yeah. So but animals... only when they're eating. Only when they're eating. If only they're sleeping, he, they, they, they sleep they randomly, scatter around. Okay. et cetera. Yeah. But the, so. the instinct thing, of course, is, I mean, it's fascinating to see how technologies mediate how we see the world, how we perceive the world. But the implications of it are actually also really important. I think that's also part of the value of the post phenological approach that you have been developing, that it also enables you to develop a more critical perspective of how oh, doctors do their work. And that there even can be at some point some kind of a normative significance 
in technologies. That Can you give an example of that? Well, in my own work, I've tried to use the post technological approach to uh, look at all kinds of diagnostic technologies, <coughs> like ultrasound, um, when you expect a child, where... Um, you could say that, of course, you can say, well, th there is a child in a womb, and now you see it, and the print of the first sonogram will be the first picture in a baby album. But you can also, uh, if, if you take the idea of mediation seriously, say that actually it, it gives <coughs> us a, a new fetus. <laughs> because in a the old days, fetus? fetus, yeah. yeah. What a fetus is has yeah. changed for us now that we have yeah. ultrasound. Yeah. In the old days, you could never see your own unborn child, your own fetus, as it no. were. And a doctor or a midwife would feel through the belly of the woman uh, the fetus inside the body or listen to the hard tones with such a big wooden tube, right? That was about it. It was a unity of mother and child that was always, uh, well, uh, present when there was a doctor. Yeah. And now suddenly uh, the child appears on a screen. The mother becomes the environment of the fetus, even a potentially hostile environment. And all yeah. things that women cannot eat and do anymore. And the list gets longer and longer. We have four kids <laughs> with every child. Uh, there was more than my wife <laughs> could not Couldn't do or do. eat whatever. <laughs> so it, the old idea of being a unity with your child was actually so I replaced with your a potential enemy <laughs> to yeah. your child. But but you you'd say that that has got something to do with the uh, with the sonograms or exactly yeah. because yeah. you can also say that the sonogram medicalizes the fetus. Yeah. And so there are all kinds of ways in which you can see whether the child might have Down syndrome or not, or has a spina bifida or something. Yeah. And suddenly, what used to be fate, when you would get a child with that kind of condition, now suddenly becomes your own responsibility. You can already know it beforehand, and in a country where abortion is legal, you can choose to have an abortion. Yeah. So uh, it, it changes a lot. It, it makes you responsible for new things, and it also changes the ways in which doctors, I think, should deal with the patient, but also the ways in which a government should organize a system of, of uh, uh, how to say, screening. And yeah. Because maybe you also need to help people to make a good decision if they find something. So yeah. mediation uh, can also have a societal implication, and not only an implication within science. Yeah, but, but I'll give uh, another example. <laughs> the next book I'm coming out is called Medical Technics. And it's a kind of combination of my own aging. And uh, one of the articles I wrote a number of years ago is called Aging, I Don't Want to Be a Cyborg. But as Peter Paul knows, I'm very cyborgian because I have artificial knees. I have a valve uh, cushion <laughs> in my heart. I have... Uh, uh, I just had cataracts and uh, new uh, hearing aids, which were very, very interesting in the process. Now, in, in all of this aging process, in 2005, I had what's called a TIA, which is in common language, a mini stroke. Yeah. And it sort of paralyzed one arm for a while. It gave me dizziness and uh, distorted vision, etc. Now, the way you prove that you have this is you take an MRI, and the MRI will show the area in the brain uh, where the blood was restricted, etc. And I had another event last year, so they did another MRI, and they said it's not a TIA, there's absolutely no evidence of anything that, that happened. Uh, whereas in the first one, there was evidence. Yeah. And, and so, and they, they tell various heart things the same way by doing angiograms and so forth, all of, all of which I've experienced. So I'm talking about this both from first-person experience and from post-phenomenological analysis of the, yeah. of the imaging that's happening. And my, I have now four chapters of aging. Of course, the <laughs> answer is being a cyborg is a lot better than being dead. <laughs> and so, even though I don't want to be a cyborg, I, I accept well, being a cyborg. But, but why wouldn't you want to be a cyborg? Uh, well, it, it, the, the, I think Merleau-Ponty's notion of embodiment is what I call the ideal sports body. Uh, his... his his notion of embodiment is sort of like uh, a ballet dancer who can do movements that that can't. And Schneider, his uh, sort of semi-paralyzed uh, person, is the opposite of that. He can't 
follow, he's forgotten how to follow commands about how to move his arms and so forth and so forth. So if you're not a cyborg, I mean, for example, artificial knees. My artificial knees are such that I'm a very slow walker and somewhat stiff. And I used to be, for some 40 years, a fairly active cross-country skier. And I can't do that anymore because I don't have the sense of balance that is necessary, et cetera. So obviously, not being a cyborg and having young knees is better than having <laughs> artificial yeah. knees. But having artificial knees is a lot better, except for going through airport security, <laughs> uh, than uh, not having yeah. artificial knees yeah. at all. But yeah. maybe so. what I learned from your analysis of, of that was also maybe the opposite, that all kinds of uh, ways of being a vulnerable person uh, can also uh, well play a role in yeah. a technological life. Absolutely. So the whole idea of human enhancement and all that neoliberal idea of hey, we're going to make ourselves bigger and stronger and live longer and happier, etc., that, that doesn't need to be the case if you look in a more phenomenological way. Then you look at your prosthesis and they wear down, they wear out, they get rusty. <laughs> they, and, and so it's not about enhancement, it's about changing ourselves and also uh, getting new ways to become vulnerable. The perfect example is cataracts. I just had a few weeks ago cataract uh, surgery. I opted for a triplex lens. You, they take your cataract natural lens out and install an artificial lens. And the triplex has multiple uh, focuses. And uh, I opted also for a special new surgical procedure called Femato Laser. Femato Laser is, uh, oh, I claim that the new technologies coming on are all nanoscaled stuff. A, nano, uh, a nanogram is one trillionth of uh, a meter. And so we're now talking about scales that we've never been able to use before in new technologies. And everything from bio technology on is based on nanoscale processes mm. and the next uh, quantum computing will also be at this and this is this is like a million times in difference in terms of magnitude than the current micro scales that we, we that we use so i opted for this procedure it's a 15 minute operation there are 3 million a year done in the united states I now have perfect vision. I don't have to use uh, reading glasses anymore. I can read the smallest line that they project. And the guys who every month now check to make sure everything is going right said, I have perfect vision. The one thing I haven't discovered yet is whether I'm going to recover. I was able with my vision before cataracts to see naked eye the uh, satellites of Jupiter. And uh, Sandra Harding in her multicultural book on science points out that the Dogon tribe in, in Africa have good enough vision that they can do the same thing. And I used to be able to do this. <laughs> and so far, all of my trips to Vermont, where I do this uh, practice, uh, have been clouded over, so I have to wait till the summer to make yeah. sure we get a nice, clear thing to see if I can still do that. If I do, I'll agree that I now have perfect vision once again. It's it's really it's the only uh, hybridized process that I've had which exceeds the compromise of. Yeah, it's a bit better, but I'm also losing something in the process. So you do want to be a cyborg. So I now <laughs> want to be a cyborg in that sense. Change your mind. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if, if they keep doing this, uh, who knows what will happen. Yeah. But Peter Paul, you mentioned that um, uh, sonograms have some unfortunate side effects, we might say, or one might say. Um, would you say there are forms of technology, and that's a question f for the both of you, um, that we just shouldn't want or that are 
off limits in, in a way. I'm also thinking of the CRISPR-Cas technology, CRISPR-Cas9, um, that allows us to, 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 in a way, edit our genetic material that we can, of course, yeah. use to cure ourselves of all kinds of diseases, yeah. but we could also yeah. enhance or change our, yeah. ourselves. Is that...? Yeah, I would say, post phenologically speaking, <laughs> <laughs> that's the wrong question. <laughs> uh, yeah. A very un understandable question, mm -hmm. but the question builds on a separation between humans and technologies, as if we would have a choice. Yeah. And I think, uh, in a sense, technological mediation is also kind of a fate that we have to face. So there is no other way than to live our lives in a technological world. Uh, you cannot undo ultrasound. Well, maybe that's a good example also in the first-person perspective as a phenomenologist <laughs> should do, as, from my own experience. Um, so I said we, had, we have four children, and with the first three, we didn't want to do the ultrasounds because we felt well, every child is welcome, we are not going to have an abortion anyway, and not yeah. for fundamentalist reasons, we just didn't <laughs> want it. Yeah. Right? And then it became harder and harder. At, at the third child, they said to us, well, then you will be, uh, you yourself will be, be responsible, responsible if you get a yeah. child with Down syndrome. Yeah. Well, is it my responsibility that I get a child? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that happens to me also, in, in a sense. But with the fourth child, we thought, well, actually, uh, we, we put our heads in the sand, as we say it in Dutch, I'm not sure if it's an English <laughs> expression, because you have become responsible. So there are yeah. lawsuits of kids suing their parents because they have not been aborted. That it, sounds it, weird. In the United but States? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. So they, they call it wrongful life cases. We also have them here in, in, in Holland, really? mostly against doctors, and it's always f funny to... But it's actually not funny, because it's horrible situations. Yeah. People who have a very serious condition, who suffer a lot, but don't even have the means in, in their bodies to end their own lives, which is the only thing that they want. And the last resort that they have is to sue their doctors or their parents for the fact that they didn't do any... any and that they are alive. Exactly. Yeah. And so we also felt that, okay, the fact that you can have an ultrasound scan has already changed it. Even yeah. without us using it, we have become responsible. And that's, I think, a good illustration of how mediation is also some kind of a fate. So we now have CRISPR-Cas, and we can do very good things with it. We can, you can do horrible things with it, but we have to face how it changes our ways of being responsible and to find a way of dealing with it, rather yeah. than asking ourselves, is it good or is it bad? Yeah. In my 1990 book, Technology in the Life World, I have a section of prediction of what the next realm of technologies will do. And one of my predictions is the increase of decisional overload. Mm. And that turns out to be quite right because deciding, for example, we now decide whether or not we will live or die. And we can decide to die if we want to do so, etc. And this is becoming more and more culturally legal in a number of United States states and a number of countries, et cetera, et cetera. And the ultrasound example you gave is just another one of doing decisional burden. Yeah. Because what technologies do is they open up fields of possibility which are wider and broader than any we've had before, which increases what I'm calling decisional burden. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, I think all of my predictions were sure in technology in the life world have come true by, <laughs> by I, the I, 21st I, century. Yeah. <laughs> Which are the other ones? Uh, well, one of the things had to do with the speeding up of mass reaction. Uh, so that if something happens, first of all, you know about it around the world almost immediately. Yeah. And so you have massive, I mean, the Trump election was one of the best examples of this because everybody knew about it going on and so forth. And I think most Europeans have almost the same attitude as New Yorkers have. <laughs> New Yorkers <laughs> voted nine to one against Trump because yeah. we don't have that many uneducated white males <laughs> <laughs> who are neo-Nazis and, and so forth in the process. And so New York City hates Trump. And Woe be to him if he decides ever to move back into Trump Tower. <laughs> <laughs> and Trump Tower is, by the way, terrible because <laughs> it's on Fifth Avenue, which is one of the main shopping uh, centers of New York City. I live in Manhattan on the Upper East Side. And it's so crowded with security people that they've actually changed the bus stops so you can't get anywhere near 
uh, his street on Fifth Avenue, which happens to be right next to Sox and, and some of the major uh, shopping areas. So he has changed the whole social pattern of, of New York City. Yeah. In the, and everybody hates it. So anyway, I'm happy to say I'm anti-Trumpian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't ex expect otherwise. Or, or I would, yeah. Uh, we wouldn't know what to, to do. <laughs> um, maybe this is the time to, 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 to get to the, the mortality part. Um, <laughs> After having had yeah. the patricides. <laughs> I'm not going to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. Um, um, in the train ride, you mentioned that you had two uh, friends, uh, Arakawa and Madeline Gins. Um, I, I, she was an architect, right? He, was, he, an architect. he, would, he was an architect. She was the wordster. She wrote books. She wrote the books. So oh. she was the one who said that um, death should be illegal. They both said that. Yeah. They, they, they have a foundation called the Reversible Destiny uh, Foundation, <laughs> and they think death should be made illegal. And uh, so... Their house, the one house that they built on the east end of Long Island, uh, is dedicated to this. And it's quite interesting because there's not a single flat floor anywhere. Everything is, is uh, curvilinear, etc. cetera. And uh, I went out there with my knees and with my <laughs> lack of sense of balance. It was horrible to move around. And I said, this is a room that cats would love. But uh, humans have a hard time. But this was deliberate. They want, they want to make everything difficult. And I said, the problem is that we humans also sleep and like to relax, and they don't have any capacity for that in the uh, reversible density house. <laughs> so uh, we became very close friends uh, for about 10 years of their last years of life. He ended up dying a few years ago of uh, ALS, and she died of breast cancer just two years ago. So they no longer exist, although their foundations, we just missed a dinner with their annual foundation uh, dinner. And I keep asking myself, why did I get so interested in this outfit? Because I'm not interested in not dying. No. I don't want to take my own life, but I'm still Heideggerian in terms of we choose our own death, and it takes a certain kind of temporal shape, etc. cetera. And uh, so, so that's mortality. That's mortality, yeah. yeah. Maybe it's also a really interesting topic from a post humanological point of view, but maybe you wanted to ask something no, more, no. yeah? Because uh, um, uh, death is one of the things of which you could say, well, uh, uh, maybe it's one of the few things that, that could not be mediated, right? And that is that. Yeah. <laughs> when you're dead, it's, it's all over. And actually, uh, in our team in Twente, uh, people have done some kind of research into how we uh, understand death through technologies. Bas de Boer, Jan de Hoek, they're here in the, in, in the room. <laughs> they wrote a very nice paper about death and what death means, uh, going into the case of brain death and how fMRI imaging or MRI imaging helps us understand death. And actually, and that also helps to, to change our ideas about death. Or, or an, another good example is uh, a, a very interesting researcher at uh, my university in Twente who works on very um, sensitive sensors to measure activity in the brain, not with MRI, but with EEG. And um, he can measure with much more... <laughs> Subtlety, the activity in the brain also of people that we call brain dead, where suddenly there appears to be much more activity than, than we ever thought. Yeah. Right? So the category of brain dead is already some kind of a, uh, an in-between twilight uh, zombie uh, zone. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly we need to, to, to shift that boundary. So uh, technology helps us actually to define what, what death means. And then, of course, that's only... Uh, 
what it is, but also how we face it existentially, what our own death means to us. I think that's the key to understanding the discussions about euthanasia. It's not something that only happens to you. Of course, it, it happens to you, but the way in which it happens to you is kind of this interesting dialectics between a, a, a fate that we have to face, but also having the means of facing that fate in a specific meaning. Think way. of how differently death is understood today than it was 50 years or 100 years ago. If you stopped breathing or your heart stopped, you were dead. This is no longer the case because you can revive people from heart stoppage and breathing, of course, can be restored, et cetera, et cetera. Now it has to be long-term brain death, which defines death differently in terms of how you measure it and how you define it, et cetera. So it's... Uh, it's really, really weird. Now, at my age, I'm experiencing uh, what a neurologist has written a lot about. There are many, many philosophers I know who are younger than I who have died. I mean, for example, Rorty, uh, Derrida, and so forth died at 75. And both of them were at Stony Brook just weeks before their death, so I got to see them and talk to them before their death. My brother, my mother, and my father all died at age 70, and I'm already five years older than their death. So one of the things that this guy has written about is when you're older than that, you experience a certain amount of guilt. Why am I living this long? And I can't help but have that. I have that. When, when a friend who is younger dies, I have guilt for being alive. And that's not post-phenomenological, that's classical phenomenology. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but I'm wondering, um, um, Peter Paul, you, you, you mentioned that... Um, no, the question is really, is, it, is the, um, the border we conceive between life and death as something that's very strict and uh, changing in a way that we see that... The, um, uh, that how we how we die, how we go from life to death, is uh, much more isn't about life and death. It's really about a process. Uh, or do you say that our concept of when when you're really 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 dead has changed? But that at some point you can say now you're still alive and this is really really dead. Yeah. No. So indeed, I think death and dying are both yeah. mediated. Yeah. So the process of, of dying is of course mediated and I think the ways in which technologies help us to, to get involved in that, however uh, nasty or uh, it, it, it may be, but that, 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 that also helps us to give meaning to what it means to be dead. Yeah. Uh, one of my PhD, recent PhD students is a French woman from the Sorbonne who chose as her dissertation topic a bodily sense of identity. And she took uh, paraplegic people as her example. These people cannot talk. They are paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, she devised a, a questionnaire which she gave both to their caretakers, i.e. the doctors, neurologists, etc., and to the patients. And what came out of the answers to these questionnaires was shocking because almost all of the caretakers thought that the paralyzed people wanted to die. In fact, none of them wanted to die, and they still thought that they had a bodily sense of identity, that they were a part of society, etc. And, of course, her founding findings now are well justified because it turns out even people whose brain processes have come to a near halt still are revivable. So we're at the edge of another frontier uh, yeah. of this. Now, I do have to say I'm still a Heideggerian in the following sense of his notion of temporality. He argued that futurity is the primary uh, temporal ecstasies and that we always plan ahead and only by reflection through the past does the past occur. 
And so the implication is, if you change your future, you change your past. Mm. And then end up in the present. The present is the last to arrive. I think he's right. And when I got divorced, I really experienced it very thoroughly because what happened was that my future understanding of my wife changed. And with it, the past changed, which led eventually to my desire to have a divorce. And uh, I found that to be a very, very existential, proper analysis of the time. And one of the interesting things about the implication of Heidegger's temporality situation, as very well established socially, is that older people have a far shorter temporal projection mm. than younger people. And so older people have a lot more memory time that they deal with and a lot less future possibility time uh, to deal with. Mm. And this is a phenomenon which has been recognized by all sorts of social scientists as well as philosophers. Maybe death is also really interesting to discuss in relation to technology because technology uh, seems to be about everything that we can make and manipulate and that we have power over and death is some fate that we yeah. have to face that we don't have the power over. And for me it's also an interesting um, thing to think about existential experiences in relation to technologies because there always seems to be some interesting way in which the very transcendence of the things that we encounter uh, peeps through the holes of technologies. Eh? When we think that we can make things at some point you have to realize that you can only do that because the world happens to be the way it is so that you can make things. One of the examples I always use to explain that is the Vatican that is against IVF because a child is something that you receive, it's not something that you make, life is a gift. Yeah. So that's why we should not do IVF. But if you look more phenomenologically, existentially, to the people that I happen to know who got a child through IVF, I think for them it was definitely a gift. Yeah. And maybe even a bigger miracle or a wonder than it was for my wife and me who just very easily got four kids, which was a miracle and very special, of course, <laughs> as well. <laughs> But if you have to wait for years and years and to suffer, etc. Yeah. So I cannot see why there should be a full opposition between technological power... Uh, on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, something like transcendence. Yeah. Technologies can also mediate that very transcendence. Nee, and of course, in the, in the example of IVF, that's 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 uh, that's no guarantee. There's no 100% chance that it will work. So, exactly. the, yeah, you don't overcome the, yeah. the difficulties. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe with death, that it's it's the same thing. So, if we could indeed change our mortality, or even live the dream of becoming immortal, then of all there are beautiful novels that explain to you what that would mean for your life. Everything would become meaningless because there's no horizon anymore. You can do everything always at some point still, right? So yeah. it it becomes very hard to live now if, if that future of dying stops. So yeah. it, it means that also that is some some fate <laughs> that you cannot make, even though the very desire is, of course, to postpone it as much as, as it long can. As possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's a way of giving meaning to our mortality. Yeah. Two of my sidelines are anthropology and animal studies. And uh, in anthropology, the last few years have been really major revolutions. Uh, and in animal studies, the same <coughs> thing. Science Magazine, at the end of 2016, points out that there are now 284 species identified as making tools and using tools in the animal kingdom. And this obviously has been going on for millions of years. Yeah. And uh, they just discovered in the Turkana Basin this last year a new set of napped, these handmade stone tools that are 3.3 million years old, which means a million years before the first homo species appeared. Yeah. So it's clear that animals beat us to technology <laughs> by a long <laughs> shot. And it's not the old notion that homo faber uh, was primary with the use of tools. It's just simply false. Yeah. It can't be supported. And so uh, I have come around to understand that when you look at the tool use of all of the animal species and of the primates uh, who used the first stone tools, etc., 
that most of the activity relates to hunting food and processing food. And Wrangham, who is an anthropologist at Harvard, theorizes that we humans evolutionarily changed our bodies by cooking so that we do not have a uh, sagittal crest which anchors our jaw, muscles, etc. We have very small teeth, we have very small guts, uh, we have big brains, and she recognized that the same thing happened with primates, but with a diverging con uh, theory because they, for example, spend six to eight hours a day chewing yeah. because their food is so rough and crude, et cetera, and they don't use tools to chop it up uh, with small pieces, and they don't use fire. So they ended up with big guts, big teeth, big muscles, sagittal crests, et cetera, and so our body shapes were shaped by how we eat and the technologies that are involved with gathering the food. I mean, for example, dolphins who dig up clams put sponges on their faces so that they don't scratch their face while they're digging the clams. <laughs> and uh, uh, that obviously affects over a long period of time, dolphin shape, uh, yeah. et cetera, as well as uh, primates who go to the big guts and, and uh, big jaws, uh, et cetera. So uh, if, if we look at tactics for the long term, let's say starting three plus million years ago, then the kind of techniques we have today are so radically different and so sped up uh, compared to the millions of years ago and so yeah. diverse. I mean, we use technologies for everything. I think it also shows maybe that uh, this approach to technology in terms of human technology relations can also be seen as maybe one of the, the most recent versions of philosophical anthropology, a philosophical way of yeah. understanding what it means to be right. human. And that field has come into being uh, in interaction with s scientific insights in what it means to be human that uh, somehow yeah, challenged our earlier ideas of, of ourselves. Yeah, when Darwin came and we were suddenly as close to the apes as we thought we were to God. Mm -hmm. And then when Freud came and explained that our ego is actually only a thin layer of resistance against things that we don't even dare to look into the eye. Right? What are we then? <laughs> and I think the interesting thing is then that it urged us to understand better the boundaries between the human and their and animals and devices, things, and uh, it enabled us also to to look for uh, for our authenticity in being inauthentic, <laughs> right? So to 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 allow technologies to be part of us and to see that actually our intestines, our our guts, <laughs> have changed because we started to cook and to cut our food, and that even at the physical level we are the product of an interaction with technology. We are yeah. technologies. Yeah. And that's not an alienation, but it actually helps us to be human. And being aware of that, taking responsibility for that, <laughs> makes us ever more human. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, one more question before we go to the, uh, to the audience. Um, so the question tonight is, how does technology change us? I think one of the technologies nowadays that people, you would never, yeah, uh, fears at, at points are, of course, smartphones. Um, there's a lot of digital detoxing going on nowadays. People uh, feeling they get stressed, burned out because of all the notifications and whatever there. So, uh, of course, they're becoming smombies. So, if you if you <laughs> look look around you, when you're not in your own phone, you see all these people doing this everywhere. <laughs> the, the How will that technology changes. It will not change our guts, I think. What? Oh, of course, it is changing us somehow cognitively, but it is not changing us in the sense that it determines us. I think what you see is a learning process. We we learn to do, I mean, it's it's, it's not uh, a coincidence that you ask this question that next week you have... Uh, we have an uh, event think, on digital uh, detoxing. <laughs> Schnitzler, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I don't agree with a lot of that, <laughs> what he says actually, but uh, uh, 
that's an attempt also to understand how smartphones organize our attention, our concentration, our social interactions. Yeah. And also a way of uh, raising awareness of it and actually shaping yourself in interaction with all those new technologies. And that's, I think, a central insight in post technology too. And also uh, things that I myself learned also more from Foucault, which is maybe not uh, full-blown phenomenology, but at least some kind of a descendant of phenomenology. And the idea of the technologies of the self. That technologies are not opposed to yourself, but it's it's a, a technique to, to shape yourself in interaction with your environment. Yeah. So a technology of the self could be indeed to live with a smartphone. And maybe detoxing uh, is one of the ways, but that actually builds again on that idea of an authentic human and an alienating technology. It's toxic. Yeah. We need to detox ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually not a language that I really like. Maybe it's, it's, it's a good opening of the discussion. But I think if we could develop authenticity in interaction with a smartphone, and that's hard work. I mean, that's not something easy, but that would be, I think, uh, for me, uh, um, well, a more natural way of formulating how we could find a productive relation to uh, to smartphones. Yeah. yeah. I don't even have a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My wife does. Yeah. So you don't need to 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 adapt and interact. And it's 95% of the world's population has access to smartphones or to phones, uh, mobile phones. And in third world countries, still developing countries, these are a leapfrog technology because no. uh, there's there are no roads. There are no line, uh, uh, power lines, lines etc. Yeah. So you have a tower which can uh, send the signals and receive the signals for the, the smartphone. So my, my favorite smartphone image is of a Maasai warrior <laughs> who is holding a spear in one hand and a smartphone <laughs> in the other hand yeah. while he's herding his cattle. <laughs> and... and, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of places, uh, women are phone uh, renters. They borrow phones at a very cheap level from the Grameen Bank, become phone ladies, and everybody in the village uses their phone to do everything from transferring money to who knows what. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's the wi widest, most universal technology ever. And I don't even have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're there. Okay. I think I think we're at the end. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. That's I okay. Think that's okay. Um, I want to thank you very much for being here, uh, Don, tonight, and I wish you both uh, a good day tomorrow.